It's Zach Eady with Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? This is Boilers in the Stands, and we're back in Better Than Ever. I'm your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me, as always, every season, every year, is my guy Craig Bowers from Boiler Diehards and Joe Jackson from Feed the Post Podcast. Uh, it's another really exciting season coming up. Purdue Boilermakers ranked number three in the country coming into the season. No surprise there with bringing back all of their, you know, main players and obviously Zach Eady returning for another season. Uh, it's really exciting stuff. And and we're excited to kick this thing off with uh, Matt Painter coming up in, in just a few moments. Uh, he, he started the season with us last year and he was, he's gracious enough to give us some of his time here today. So uh, new look here uh, at Boilers in the Stands. We we're, we got to work here this offseason, and we have a new uh, vision for how this is going to go. You know, we started a little bit of a rebranding here uh, to an extent, and, you know, we've started a Twitter page here recently. Uh, make sure you go ahead and follow that. Once we reach 1,000 followers, we're going to be giving away a signed Zach Eady jersey that I have just over my shoulder right over here. And uh, we're excited to give that away and, and do some other things. You know, we have a website in the works uh, getting ready to launch here soon. Uh, this is our new logo for our Boilers in the Stand shows. We're going to have merchandise uh, that you'll be able to purchase here very shortly on our Brags in the Stands, um, you know, uh, Teespring page. Uh, there's also, there's all, already Boilers um, merchandise on there as well with my guy Sasha and the Serbian Sniper. So, a uh, lot of different things coming down the coming down the pipeline for all you Boilers fans, but most importantly, some great coverage this season. We already got things kicked off with the open scrimmage here on Saturday. Put a bunch of really good content on our Twitter page. So you know if you're if you're um, tempted to get on the mean streets of Twitter, I know sometimes some people want to avoid that that street, but we got some really good content coming on there. Of course, our Facebook page, and then make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So there's all the stuff got out of the way. Uh, excited to kick things off. Excited to launch this new era of Boilers in the Stands. So uh, we'll start off with you, Craig. How are you feeling today? Man, th this is a new feel doing this in the morning. I, I got to tell you, like, I'm a night owl. <laughs> like, I was like, I've been spent the last hour and a half trying to wake up, but um, can always get woke up uh, any anytime that you're going to have Matt Painter on. Always a great interview. Uh, I'm super excited to hear some of the things that he has to, to say. We had a chance to talk to him after the scrimmage the other day, but didn't get to get real in depth with 
some of the more overarching questions or, or some of the questions about what he thinks about the team um, relative to the upcoming season and some of the games that they're going to play. So as always, uh, super excited to be on uh, with you guys um, and excited to talk to Matt Painter here in just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joe, uh, we're back at it. We, we lost your sidekick, Aiden. You know, he's over yeah. coaching at Incarnate Word. Uh, obviously, he'll be sor sorely missed. We we love Aiden. Uh, but when you two joined last year, it was an element to this show for Craig and I that we really appreciated because you bring an insight uh, that, you know, from a fan standpoint, we not all of us understand the game at that level from a coaching or an analytical standpoint. And uh, we're excited to continue on this journey with you. We wish Aiden, our guy, good best of luck going forward. Um, but excited to keep you here on board and, and, and continue to learn from the knowledge you have of this game. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to kind of keep this thing growing. Like you said, with the rebrand and all that stuff, uh, shout out Aiden. Their first game is November 6th at Texas. If they win, there might be a thread Ooh. on Twitter. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, big things, big things for them this year. Hopefully uh, I know he's, he's hopeful that they will be competitive within the conference. Who knows? Maybe, Maybe someday we'll see him in the tourney. Um, but yeah, in terms of me, I'm just I'm excited to kind of just be able to pick Matt's brain a little bit. Um, we we know like I enjoy the X's and O's, I enjoy the analytics. So being able just to, you know, he's one of the best coaches in college basketball, being able to pick his brain uh, just for a little bit on stuff like that, I'm super excited for. Yeah. Uh well, obviously you got to talk to him about the Chicago action, right? Definitely I mean, this will. is something we've talked about a million times here on the show. We call it the CHGO action in honor of uh chgo sports the company i cover chicago sports with but uh yeah excited to hear some of those details from your standpoint you know and that's what we do here if you're new to this show you know what uh, yeah i'm the meatball of this crew you know uh craig craig's got the the you know thirty thousand feet view of this thing he's been close to this program for a long time and no, that's not an age joke, Craig. You know, I love you. <laughs> but it's I true. You. you have an understanding of the history of this program at a level that Joe and I uh, don't. And we we appreciate that perspective because it's, it's definitely needed. And as we've said, Joe brings the X's and O's and the analytical standpoint to things. So that's what we do. If you're new here, make sure you st stay tuned in all season long. We do immediate post-game shows as soon as the game is over. Those were a lot of fun last year. And, uh, you know, we do weekly interviews with different players, uh, some former, some current, depending on availability and scheduling. Uh, so we, we, we try to look at it from a different perspective, bring in some unique guests, you know, like our guy, Jared Harder, who was a, a Purdue manager here and, and a lot of fun. And, and we do different things like that. So, and we try to focus on you guys, the fans as well. Uh, always want to give the fans in the stands perspective. So uh, that's what we're doing here. Matt Painter is going to be joining us uh, here in about five to five to seven minutes. So we'll just kick things around. You know, we, we had an opportunity, like I said, to go to the scrimmage, the open scrimmage for fan day, which was a lot of fun to watch uh, and, and see this new look team right before they get ready. I mean, we got Arkansas here coming up on Saturday. So it's, it's game week now in a lot of ways, but you know, from what you guys saw, I mean, obviously I think the biggest takeaway is what Trey Kaufman Wren's, you know, development and next step in his progression is going to be for this team. I mean, that's certainly a wrinkle that seems like it's going to have a more important role to this team this year. Yeah. But yeah. I, you got it. I, I mean, yes. Um, I, I also feel like we've known that for a little while now, like like watching um, the, the Europe trip and even um, on the alumni day where they scrimmaged a little bit, too. So, yeah, I, I mean, his improvement uh, in terms of what he can do as a scorer and just how important he's going to be to this team and being able to play alongside Zach and if he can defend the four effectively it is going to be so vital to this team. Um, but, you know, I, I thought there were other couple of things that maybe weren't on our radar from the scrimmage that maybe jumped out a little bit more even. Yeah. And that starts, I, that, that starts with Ethan Morton. Um, he was one of the best players out there. Felt like in more of a facilitating role, he was for two of the three scrimmages, he was playing point guard. Um, he was recruited as a point guard. I mean, Matt Painter, like 
when when Matt Painter recruited Ethan Moore and he said he's the best passer I've ever recruited. Um, and obviously it's been an up and down journey for him so far. Hopeful that whatever role it is, you know, maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe he is 25 minutes if he's, you know, that that uh, effective in his role. Whatever it is, just being able to find spots for him to facilitate. Um, I like him. It's it's tough with you know ED and TKR because of how much um, kind of respect they demand in the post, especially kind of at times can clog up the lane for others. Um, but if Ethan Moore can be like this short roller and now he takes one dribble and kicks out or, or things like that. Um, and then just the confidence with him too. Like that was huge. If just, It goes for pretty much everybody on the team. Like I think when we look back at the FDU game, um, the confidence just looks shot for basically everybody on the team. Ethan Moore looks super confident. Obviously it's an inner squad, inner squad scrimmage. So you want to see it, you know, it, we want to see it against Arkansas. We want to see it against Furman and, and, or Sanford, I mean, and, and all that. So, um, but it's still a good first step and something I'm excited to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Craig, uh, outside of Ethan Morton, you said there were a few things that stood out. What else to you uh, stood out that you weren't expecting? Um, I, I just think how good Lance Jones looked and how athletic he looked on, on both ends of the floor, both defensively and offensively. I think because of his last year's stats at Southern Illinois, a lot of people maybe weren't as excited um, when we landed that transfer in the portal. Um, but man, um, I, I forget who came out. Somebody came out with a, where they interviewed a bunch of coaches from his conference right after that. And all those coaches were effusive in their praise and about their thoughts about his ability to transition and do those same things in the big 10. And he just showed out there on the court, especially when he just barely missed that last second shot. I, think he went end to end in like two seconds um really fast super athletic and there's a difference between athletic without the ball in your hands and athleticism with the ball in your hands and he's a guy that's athletic with the ball in his hands and i think there's just a different element that he's going to provide um i don't know you know I, I have no idea uh who eventually starts on this team and i think it might change several times uh throughout the season but I would not be shocked at all if at some point Lance starts um, with with Braden um, and and somebody else, whether that's Fletcher or whoever, at some point around him as well. Yeah, I it, 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 well, that was what was interesting to me was when it was over, you kind of revised, you know, when we did our mailbag show the other day, I think we all were in agreement that it would be Zach Eady, Trey Kaufman, Wren and on the front court, and then you'd have, you know, Fletcher lawyer and Braden Smith. And then the third question, it was like, okay, well, who's going to be that, that guy. And we all picked Ethan Morton, you know, for his defensive prowess, but you've revised that Craig. Now you think that it'll be Lance Jones potentially. I mean, you don't have to write it in, 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 right. in, in pen. It, it, it's written in pencil at this point, but now you're leaning <laughs> that way, huh? If, if I was going to make a, if I was going to lay a bet right now, um, that would be my best guess bet. And, and that's not with high confidence whatsoever. Um, but if Ethan's going to, as much as he played point guard in the scrimmage the other day, if Ethan's going to be the backup point, um, like if that's going to be his first role, um, then yeah, I could see Lance starting and Fletcher pushing over to the three because he, Lance in many ways will do the same thing Ethan does defensively. Like Lance is going to guard the best offensive option uh, from a guard wing standpoint on that other team. Now, if we go up against a team where they've got a three that's six foot seven, you know, then maybe that starting lineup isn't the one that's out there. So how about you, Joe? Where, where do you stand on it? Um, I just, I mean, it's, it's possible. They, they threw the three guard lineup out there. Um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around how that works defensively, even though Lance Jones is good. He's six one or whatever it is. Um, it's just, super small one two and three I, I i don't know there's the talent there and i get what he can do physically um and especially against some smaller teams but i have a hard time i have a hard time getting there i think for the long term especially in big 10 play but if he's an if he's a legitimate option there that's only a good thing like that just means that's another option that painter has in his bag yeah uh it'd certainly be interesting and, and that's something i think we'll we'll need to ask matt is trading more offense for defense you know is he is that something that he's starting to you know try to find not that he's not looking for more offense but we know how much he values 
you know, taking care of the basketball and defense, you know, those are, Mm -hmm. those are staples of the Matt painter system and, and what this Purdue basketball program is all about. So, you know, now that, you know, when, you know, obviously we all understand the elephant in the room and the failures of this team in March. And when you get against some of these teams where you just need to flat out outscore them, you know, and, and getting into a, a grinder game, may be what is best in the big 10 and can win you 25 big 10 championships. Is there something to be said about trading off for a little more offense at the, at the sacrifice of some defense to be ready to play in March? Well, and that's something he's referenced in, in multiple interviews in the off season of, and I think that's been the impetus behind, um, you know, TKR playing be- beside Zach is how do we get more points? How do we get more offense out there? Because um, at times at the end of last year, it really just, a lot of the season, the way with, with the, as much a good post play as Purdue's had over the last few years, it's post and three is your primary scoring options, you know? Um, but when the three balls not fallen, is there another way to score? And with TKR out there, um, it, it gives you some other options. Um, one of the reasons I said what I said about Lance is Lance being out there, I think gives some other options in terms of uh, his athleticism to be able to blow by people and create in slightly different ways. Um, and he's a physical guy. And like, I know Joe, you said six foot one, but he's a real six one. I mean, yeah. I've walked by some people that are listed at six feet that are, are not as tall as me. And, um, and, and he's a real six one to me. No, he definitely is. Um, one other, I just kind of, one other thing I meant or I saw in the scrimmage that I liked, uh, was Edie's passing. I thought he would made some good reads out of the post, I think the biggest thing with that is just staying almost staying calm. He's like Northwestern did it. They are just going to be super, super physical. They are going to double every single post up and it can cause them problems. Um, I don't know if we saw as much physicality as maybe we'll be allowed in big 10 play, but just some of the reads he made, there was patience. Obviously he's seven, four with the, what is it? Seven, 10 wingspan or whatever. Like he can pass over guys. Um, But I like the composure he kind of had within those double teams as well. Just another kind of smaller thing that I think, we'll have to see more of, especially like, especially some of these earlier buy games. Like I assume teams are going to, you know, like that's what they're going to do. Double and triple team. Yep. That's absolutely what they're going to do. And uh, what we're going to do is bring on our very special guests here tonight or here today. I'm so used to doing these night shows, uh, help lead the Purdue Boilermakers to their 25th big 10 championship. And now he's leading us into the 2023 season as the number three team in the country joining us for the second year in a row is our guy head coach matt painter how we doing tonight how we doing today matt doing good doing good you're gonna get stuck on that a few times huh yeah i'm not used to the morning i'm not used to the morning rips but uh you know i i'm 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 enjoying it though because i'm i'm trying to get my bearings a little more and then i then i can attack the rest of my day so uh, we'll get right into it because we know you have a busy schedule and we appreciate you carving out some time for us. No um, yeah, of course. It was it was nice to go to the, the fan day and the open scrimmage. I think that's a really nice touch that the program does to let the fans kind of get ingratiated with the new team and players and let fans have a moment to take a picture or get an autograph and and see this team in action. And, and I enjoy how you do these practices where you let the assistant coaches do the thing and, and you kind of stay off to the side and, and, and survey the rest of what you're trying to take, you know, take advantage of from the bird's eye view. You know, when you talk about the newcomers, Lance Jones and, and Miles Colvin and, and, and guys of that nature, even Camden Heidi, who's, you know, a redshirt freshman who I think we're all very intrigued to see with his athleticism. How do they get ingratiated with a team that really came together so well last year and and try to find their wrinkle into what you guys have already built from last year? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, some of our new guys like Lance Jones and Cam Heidi, Miles Colvin, um, you know, Brian Waddell technically, you know, has been out for a couple years, even though he played some for us last year, he was still really recovering. Um, you know, from a torn ACL, MCL, PCL. And so um, they have a lot of physical gifts 
And I, I think that's when you watch, you know, those guys, you know, you see Lance Jones give us some quickness. You know, I think you see that play where he went coast to coast and almost made that layup at the buzzer for the win, I think, in the second scrimmage. Um, you know, you see Cam Heidi drive baseline and have a couple drives and show his athleticism. Those guys give us something that we didn't have, but they also got to get themselves in a position where they know what they're doing at all times. And I think that's the key. I think a lot of times people don't understand that piece of it. They just look at highlights and they look at clips, but you got to know what you're doing. You got to understand our defensive rules. You got to be able to execute. You just can't know the plays offensively. You got to know what everybody does offensively. And when you can do that, now you can really conceptualize why we're running the play, where we go when our first option is taken away, where we go after our second option is taken away, and then be able to read things. When you're just doing it because that's what the coach says and you're really not reading anything, you know, you're not helping, you know, the bigger picture of what we're trying to do is just really be, you know, a very efficient offensive team. So we like those pieces. We're just trying to, you know, help those guys, you know, get a feel for things and understand what's going on. And then kind of waiting, to be honest with you, there hasn't been, there's been a little separation with those guys. I think Lance Jones has definitely helped himself, um, but he still has a lot of details and, and little things that he has to clean up. The other guys are, are pretty brand new. Um, even though they might have been here, like Brian's been here three years, it's still brand new for really the competition piece of it and, and really kind of, you know, trying to find his role along with, you know, Miles Colvin and, and Cam Heidi. I thought Ethan Morton, d you know, did a lot of little things for us in the scrimmage. It might not look like in the box score, but, you know, he just has an understanding of what's going on. So he definitely has an advantage with that. You know, I think Cam's ability to rebound really helps us. Lance's ability to defend um, and, and play both guard slots um, really helps us. So, you know, we're excited about those guys, but we're also, you know, trying to, you know, work things to where there's separation so we can get, you know, a rotation. Sometimes you don't get a set rotation, um, and other times you do. Uh, but most of the time, you know, you work your way into it. When it comes to Miles Colvin, uh, it seemed like, you know, obviously the open scrimmage probably wasn't his best day. I think he'd be the first to admit that. Is there an element with him? Cause he just, just from seeing him come to a lot of games here the last few years, he, he seems very quiet and reserved. And is there a side of him that you have to bring out or do you like that calm demeanor and, and just, and just trying to build that confidence. I think every freshman that comes in thinks they're the guy and fans are very excited for him. There's been a lot of hype around him the last couple of years because he's got a highlight reel that will get any fan excited, yeah. but getting into your program, getting that confidence, you know, and building up um, a, a killer's mentality and demeanor. Is that something that is going to be part of his development? Well, I think more than anything, knowing what he's doing, I think it's there's nothing that's going to overwhelm you in our program in terms of a learning curve. But all of it together sometimes is hard for a young player. And, and that's just what he's going through. And what he's going through right now is what everybody has gone through um, that, you know, that's played for us as a freshman. And and so, like, we're, you know, we're not kind of at that point. I know this. You can't when you're quiet. You can't let your personality be your competitive personality. And that's something for us that we really fight those guys on from day one, especially when they're quiet. It's just like, like this is a non-negotiable. If you can't talk and play, then you can't play. You know, you're not going to play. So, like, you got to be able to communicate. You got to be able to talk because you're just going to break us down if you don't know what you're doing and you can't communicate. So, with quiet guys, we've had a lot of them. We really work on that right away. Miles is making strides. He's making improvements. He's getting better. Um, but it's still frustrating. And the thing for him is that he's by himself. Like normally you come in, you got three other freshmen with you. And then collectively you guys are all like, ah, we're just kind of all going through this at the same time and um, just got to keep getting better. And for him, he's by himself, even though we have a couple new guys, you know, for him, you know, he, as a true freshman scholarship player, you know, he's, he's by himself. So you feel like 
mean you're on an island a lot of time because your name gets called, but that's part of it. Everybody goes through that, but he's going to be a fabulous player for us. You know, he's, he can shoot the basketball. He's athletic. Um, and, and, and right now it's kind of the, the dog days, right? It's the dog days of starting your college career and going through things. And, and uh, you know, we just got to get him where, you know, he's understanding everything. And once he, once he can get to that point, I think he'll take off. Yeah. Matt, you mentioned uh, Ethan Morton, and I, I guess for me at the scrimmage, I thought that was um, – I thought Ethan really jumped out. And just looking at that box score in 30 minutes, eight points, eight assists, four rebounds, four steals, only two turnovers. I thought he looked really confident and looked like he was playing really loose. And two out of those three scrimmages uh, primarily played the point guard. And I remember when you were recruiting him, there was a lot of talk about him playing the point, and I think you – at one point called him one of the best passers you'd ever recruited. Right. Is that something this year, you know, with Ethan, is that going to be a little bit more of his role potentially to backing up some point guard minutes? Yeah, I think so. You know, we've done this because, you know, we, we wanted Braden and Lance to play some together, which they're obviously going to at times. And so now it put the, you know, him as the primary ball handler, um, you know, for, the next group we've kind of blended in things, you know, Ethan has played with those two also, and he's played with um, Fletcher in that mix along with Braden. So like it's back and forth, but he's probably been that ball handler more um, than anybody else. Right. As it went from Braden to Lance to him. Uh, but I thought he did some really good things. I, I thought he made some, you know, some plays. You're showing that drive that he made there. He made a couple pull-ups, but he does a lot of little things. And so that's, we, we definitely need it from people that have been here. Uh, we can't be harping on the same stuff. And if you're harping on the same stuff and they've been in here for three, four years, you know, it speaks for itself. You know, we, we got to be able to grow. And that's where we got to have an advantage over a lot of people in college basketball because we do have a lot of returns. And, and everybody makes a big deal about experience. You know, experience is deceiving. You know, you got to have experience of success. And we have a lot of guys with experience, but we also have a lot of guys that have had experience of winning. And uh, that, that is so important because there's a lot of people piecing teams together with 22 and 23-year-olds that barely know each other. And uh, that's just the landscape we're under. But we obviously aren't that way. Um, we might end up having to be that way at some point, but we're, we're not that way right now. So we got to be good at those, all those little things. Yeah, Coach. Um, one of the things we do on our post game shows is we break down sets, um, one, one or two game, whatever. And one of the common actions that has appeared is the Chicago action. Um, a lot of people call it Zoom action. For anybody that doesn't know, it's a pin down into a handoff. What about this action um, makes it so successful? Not only for you guys, but it is you know a pretty common action just across college basketball in general. Yeah. Well, we've ran the action for a long time, and yeah. uh, we actually used to have it as a play. Um, where it first started about 15 years ago. And then we incorporated it when, it when it started to be more prevalent in college and pro basketball, you know, about eight to 10 years ago to where we run it, you know, just through our motion. And, you know, it forces the guy um, that's coming off of it because of the down screen. It forces him tight if the guy could score. You'll see a lot of people just sprint under it and meet that person, but they're not going to sprint under it and meet that person if that guy's a shooter. And so it forces you tight. And so then when you get to the dribble handoff, you've had to go tight off of that down screen. And now you probably have to go tight off of the dribble handoff or the some people will do a quick pitch, then a ball screen at the end of it. Not all the time, but um, there's certain people that will do that. So then it forces them tight. And so now you've got the center having to help as that guy's looking to shoot it or drive it at that point. A lot of people will open up that opposite elbow area opposite wing so now you have more room to attack and they'll stick somebody in the corner then the five will dive off of that and try to put you in the mix as the guy setting the screen which a lot of people have their four doing it is raising that behind that so if that's the guy that stops the five and then the five stops the basketball you got that pitch back behind you excuse me a throwback behind you then you have that shot, you have that drive going the other way, and you also have a high-low. So there's just a lot of good things that can happen off of that action. When you talk about – I think one of the biggest things that stood out to me last year in talking to you after games was when you guys had faced Micah Shrewsbury, and I asked you about 
you know, that chess match. And you told this story about how, when he was coaching here, you guys pulled things from the Celtics. And when he was coaching there about what worked against him and trying to reverse engineer that. Correct. When you talk about when, when you go into that mindset, how much are you reverse engineering what worked against you guys last year, you know, and, and right. try, trying to take that and then use it to your advantage? Yeah. Well, we were the 14th best defense in the country out of 360 teams last year versus the top 100 in the country. We were the best offensive team versus the top 100 in the country. But yet we were 22 and then 12 versus everybody, which makes absolutely no sense. You know, <laughs> just says that you're really you're, – you're, you're, the, you're the best offense against the best teams, but yet you're the 12th best offense versus everybody. Well, you should be a little bit less versus the better teams and a little bit better versus the worst teams. But we weren't, which makes absolutely zero sense. Um, I've never been a part of something like that that's been extreme on both, um, you know, ends of the floor. So for us, when you look at it, like there's not a much of adjustment when you deal with guys that are 300 pounds. Like you, you don't just have a, a plethora of things that you can do in ball screen defense with that. So what I thought we did in ball screen D with Zachary was we, we got really good at what we did. And we didn't have a lot of wiggle room there. And, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, for us, our ability to, to keep the ball in front of us and keep it out of the paint, we did a good job collectively of keeping the ball out of the paint. But once people got to the paint, we struggled. So we did a really good job of not getting it there. But when it did get there, you know, the other team had a lot of success. So really trying to be better and keep improving on keeping the ball out of the paint, but also be better at, at defending the rim and just defending once it does get in. Now, everybody's vulnerable when it, once it gets in. That's why people want paint touches, right? So, like, that's a key, key deal. So, you, you want to limit them to be able to reverse the basketball, but not at the expense of the ball being driven to the paint. So, people will say, well, deny reversals, deny this, deny that. And, well, if you're denying passes and that guy gets beat off the bounce – you know, now they're living in the paint, and that's not what we want. So we got to be better at containing the dribble, but we got to be better in our awareness. And, and more than anything, you'll hear coaches talk about you got to stay connected. And all that means is whatever your rules are, whatever your job is, you do it, and you do it at a high level. When you start doing things that, that, that we don't know about, it's not that it's that bad. It's just you're shocking your teammates. They don't know what the hell you're doing. If you're supposed to stay tight on a ball screen, stay tight. If you're supposed to go under, go under. And then when people come out there and then it's basic stuff that we drill and, and they have no clue what we're doing and we've been working on it since June and you have a good team, they can't play. They can't. I don't care what their talent level is. You can't right. play. Like, and then the other thing for us is it's, you know, we have a very good front line. I feel comfortable with any of those guys playing with Zach. Um, but, you, but you have to understand it's the value of offense and defense of them playing with Zach. So it's not them as a standalone player. It's, are we better with this guy defensively with Zach? Or are we better with this guy offensively with Zach? And then you kind of, you know, you work towards some of those things and those answers in trying to help your team. So he's going to bring value to other people, Right. You know, they overdo things with him. They overdo his dives. They overdo his post-ups. They sag. A lot of people don't double the post. A lot of people play one-on-one. -on -one. So when they come to play us, if that's what they want to do, we're cool with it. I call it killing the dragon. We'll throw the ball to him every single time. <laughs> you know, and yeah. they'll be like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, if he can touch the ball at seven feet on every single possession, I bet you people are fouling out. I bet you we're getting to the free throw line. I bet you they're at some point they're going to help. You know, and so then people start doing things and they start doing things that they don't practice because he causes that matchup. So he's bringing a great deal of value to other players on our team. They got to bring value to him, too. So it, it's got to be a two way street. So if you can bring value to him, if you're a good post feeder, if you can knock down threes consistently, if you can play without turning the basketball over, if you know what we're doing offensively excuse me, defensively, 
and, and, and you can sit with, you know, with our system and our rules and know what's going on. Now you bring value to Purdue, but you bring value with him out on the court. And that's what wins for us. So if we can collectively do that, we'll, we'll be in great shape. I mean, you talk about the, the difference between playing the good teams and then the others, I, I, to me, it's never a talent issue the last few years. I mean, we all understand the elephant in the room and you've addressed it here this off season. Some of the, the March failures that, that have fans just reeling and understandably so, but to me, it never has anything to do with pressure or, or to talent. It's about the pressure. And I know you're a big Cubs fan. You're just like me. And, I, and so many times here on this show, I I've drawn a lot of parallels to this program and the Cubs. Like, they just need to, you talk about the dragon. It's just about this, this dragon that seems to be that you guys need to slay. That just is like standing in the corner, staring at you at all times. And I know right. you've had to wear this more than anybody else in the program, but to an extent, I think the players, even if they haven't been here, feel that. How do you get these guys the way Joe Madden got the 2016 Cubs to just forget about that crap? and and put the pressure to the side and just find that killer mentality with inside of them and stop to never let you know joe madden always said never let the pressure exceed the pleasure how do you get these guys to constantly just appreciate the moment attack the moment and not think about what's on the line i think first of all we need to trade for john lester <laughs> and, and, and get him and some dribble down post ups, and then I think we're going to be perfectly fine. Like um, <laughs> no, um, you know, think about this from a game standpoint. So we shoot a lot of threes. A lot of people shoot a lot of threes, right? It's a big part of the game. Every game that you see this, high volume threes, low percentage, high volume turnovers. Like, just text me every time you see a team win when that happens. And I bet you you don't text me very often. But that's what we've done in our last two losses in the NCAA tournament. Unnecessary turnovers, high-volume turnovers, high-volume threes at a low percentage. So, for us, we're a very good offensive rebounding team. If we get five more shots instead of those five turnovers and we miss them, we win the game in each game. And we miss the shots because what those turnovers do to you is that they put them in advantageous positions going in the other direction that creates offense for them. So we're not just turning it over. We're turning it over and creating offense. So it's the giveaway takeaway. A lot of times what fans get and they, 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 what they don't understand is you can make really good decisions and have a bad result. So if you're playing poker – and it's 78% of winnability, and you're at 22%, and you lose, you don't walk away from that and saying, I made the wrong decision because I lost. You walk away from that and say, that's 78-22, man. I'm going to live on that 78%. And then you, you, you have it happen again, and it's 78-22. It just fell into the bucket of 22% twice. So when you result, Excuse me, when you when you get into that, that's that's what it's called. It's resulting. It's what poker players will do and just say, Hey man, like I'm making the right decision. It just didn't go my way and these things. So when you look at that and fans just say, Hey, what you're doing is not working, and then you say, Well, you got the best offense in the country. So you got to understand versus the top one hundred the year before, we had the second best offense. And then last year we had the best offense. And then Two years ago, our defense was horrendous. And so people are like, hey, what you're doing is not working. But we weren't connected. We didn't have everybody doing what they were supposed to be doing. And then last year we did. Even though we weren't like elite, we were still 22 versus everybody and 14 versus the top 100. That's pretty damn good. That's really good. Yep. And so like what you're doing, but you're getting into – you're not playing a best of five series. You're not playing a best of seven series. It's the way it is. It's the tournament. So you got to be able to get into these games and take care of the basketball and give yourself a chance. Because if you do that and you have a cold shooting night, then you're still going to win the game. But if you do that and you have a cold shooting night and you turn it over, now you're going down to the wire. And that's what both of those games were first teams that we should have beat. So 
when you go back there and, and you see how the sausage is made, you say, okay, we got some areas here that we got to improve from a personnel standpoint. But then again, we've done some really good things. We just haven't played that well at the end of the year. So from a functionality standpoint, we just got to keep being better at what we do and, and, and stay right there because we're doing some really good things. But you can't get into those situations and just start kicking the ball all around and expect to have a good result. Yeah. <clears throat> and and kind of jumping off that, you talk about the tournament and being a single game elimination. And I've just always wanted to ask this question, can, kind of from a philosophical standpoint about how champions are selected in any league. You know, we see some of them have a best of series. Uh, some of them have pool play and then after pool play, single elimination. Some sports um, let less amount of teams in. So regular season means more. Or even we look at volleyball like the first round, you get home court advantage that first round. While right. the NCAA tournament might be the most exciting way of picking a champion, does it do the best job of actually finding the best teams? You know, I believe so. And I like the format of, of where it is, even though like we've, you know, we've been knocked out. I think it's, it's, it's the right way. It's a beautiful thing because you, you have that unpredictability um, of the tournament and uh, that's what the tournament's all about. And, and, and so for, for me, like, I, I, I do think it's the best, you know, and, and you know, add in more teams, I like it in theory, but in reality, it scares me. I, I just I worry about trying to fix something that's not broken. You know, I, I think we're at a pretty good number right now. But I know that as these leagues start to get bigger, you know, we're always on a conference level going to try to do everything in our power, what's best for our league. And then when you're at a national um, office or committees or however you want to look at it, you know, you, you want to do what's best for college basketball. And, and there there could become kind of a set to where you have the automatic bids, but then you have some at-larges that have to be guaranteed for low to mid-major teams. You know, I think as these corporations instead of conferences are happening, um, that might be something that they have to take in to account because we don't want to lose that. We want to keep, you know, the David versus Goliath. We want to, we want to have these type of matchups – um, because that's what makes our tournament special. What about the basketball? I know you're not big on excuses, um, but it does drive me crazy that there isn't one standard basketball. And I understand the money aspect and the business side of it, but it drives, it, it drives everybody crazy. It drives coaches, players, everybody. Like we got to get one basketball. We got to get it to where in the guy, the ball they were using last year was like a pumpkin. We used it a couple times. It was uh -oh. bad. Like, it's the first time I've heard other players, like I've always, you know, like, like talk about it, like other teams. It wasn't like from our team, but like, you know, a couple of our guys said it after we played Davidson and Indians. said, man, that ball was awful. That was awful. Then other guys are like, you know, no big deal. You know, it's like that's it didn't even affect them at all. So I think it's, it's probably particular, but there's too many teams. It's too many individual players because we got to listen to the players on that. That are, that are talking about, you know, just the, the feel of that ball. And it, it ended up being an NCAA tournament ball. And, um, you know, so we, we talked about it in our meetings. It got brought up. And I, and I shared the same, uh, you know, intel that I had gotten from other people and other teams and, and the people complaining. Then there's people out there that says it, you know, they didn't even notice it at all. So I think it's just in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, I want to go back to the defense for a little bit. Um, the defense was 14 points per 100 possession worse with Edie off the floor. That's not like a big shot with shock with just how good Edie is. One thing I noticed, especially on the Euro trip, was um, is, is one specific play really stands out in my head. is It was a side ball screen. You guys didn't ice uh, Gillis hard hedges, and their big kind of got the short roll. Um, and instead of kind of being scrambled and, and out of place, TKR just then steps up to the big. Gillis rotates back to the five. And so now you have, you know, your five on the four and right. Gillis on their five. Do you expect there to be a little bit more almost like flexibility, I guess, when ED is off the floor this year um, and for the defense to maybe not fall off yeah. as drastically? Yeah, we've we've spent more time hedging high with those guys. And like when those guys were at five, when they were at the five, whether that was Trey or Caleb, like we played more in a drop with them and they don't have elite size 
Um, and obviously we've been spoiled. So what we think is elite size is probably different than others. And so we've really worked hard at being more aggressive and hedging higher with, uh, with Mason, Caleb and Trey, and just trying to push that ball handler back as much as you can. There's been so much, you know, push to like, from an analytics standpoint of just trying to get guys into those runners and those floaters and those tough twos. And so like, we're no different. And so like we get people into a lot of tough twos and rightfully so, but they're also getting into the paint more when you're in that drop. So it's a little counterproductive. So you're getting something that you want, but then again, what do you want? You want to get into the paint, right? And so now you're kind of, you're not inviting them in there, but you're not, you know, impeding their progress. So like, I think the mix of that to where we can push some guys back, um, but, it, but it gets different. Like, you know, people will do those ghost screens and they slip out of a lot of things. And, you know, you've got to be able to read and understand what they're doing. And then some people like just watching film, you can get a gauge on a lot of different things. And then a lot of different, like other people just mix things up. And that's where the unpredictability of it gets you in between. And so like we do a lot of like high hedging, but if you can't get to a good angle, um, not talking about Zach or Will, but the other guys, we always just tell them to switch that. So we'd rather stop your action at that point and then kind of cut our losses because we want to get aggressive when we're hedging high like that. And that's what we used to always do. Like Rob Hummel and JJ, that's, that was it. That was it. Like we were into the basketball. We were aggressive. We hedged high. We got after it. But it, when you hedge high and you extend a little bit, you're also lengthening your rotation if you have to get into a rotation. If you can, like, snuff it out and knock the ball out right there and that guy can make it hard for you to kick back and throw back to that guard coming out of the corner, then, like, you've really bottled them up. But if they get a good split or they get outside that guy's shoulder, it opens up pretty quickly, and now you're in a rotation, and now you've got big people scrambling. And that, that's normally at that point pretty advantageous for the offense. So you just got to gauge that and see where it is, you know, from high hedging to dropping to switching. Um, you, you just got to have a balance of what they're trying to do, what you're trying to do defensively. But it really comes down to our personnel. You know, we want to put guys in those positions to be aggressive um, when it's something that they're capable of doing. We don't want to put somebody in position. That's why we have that early exit to where – if you come on that high hedge and you don't have a good angle, don't just keep coming. You're just going to foul them. You know, your angle stinks. So when you come and you get that good angle and you get that butt to the sideline and we stay into it, you know, now you stay with that. Now you push that ball out. Then it really helps. But if you're sloppy there, don't keep coming. Just stop in your tracks and switch that to where we might not like that matchup, but we're not creating, you know, just an, an easy operation there where they can just drive it get somebody else to help, and now someone's getting a good shot. All right, we're going to let you go here in a second. I got three rapid-fire questions for you. So how many threes is Zach Eady going to take this year? Twelve. Twelve. Interesting. Uh, we didn't see any of the scrimmage because I know you say, hey, you got to do it in practice before you do it in the game, but I think a lot of fans like to talk about that. All right, who's getting a, who's getting a statue first outside of Mackey, Robbie Hummel or Zach Eady? They say there might be one of Robbie Hummel. They just can't find it. <laughs> so All right. they're, they're, they're still looking. You know, it's kind of like a it's, it's kind of like Bigfoot, right? <laughs> like they, they they show some like some shadows or something that looks like Bigfoot or a statue. So that's still up in the air. You never know. It might well, exist. <laughs> All right. Final rapid fire. Uh, come sign and show Hey Otani this off season. Um, man, I, I hope so. But like, I like their team period. Like I like their team. Like I, I like their P as long as you re-sign Cody Bellinger. Yep. I, I, I like their pieces. They have good young arms. They just got hurt. Like they yep. just like, yeah. Like you got two guys like that are pitching in their bullpen that started in the rotation at the beginning of the year. You got good young players that were coming up. And even though they didn't do a whole lot, like you're not going to do a whole lot. When you get 25 at bats, that's not the way it works, but like they got good young players. They've done a good job. Um, all of their trades were, were positive. 
I, I, they shouldn't have let, and I said it when it happened, they shouldn't have let Schwarber go for free. Oh, like man. that made no, that made no sense to me when you knew the DH, you knew the DH was coming in. Yeah, like, I, and, yeah. and they, and they signed, over, I and they wait. signed Jock Peterson for like, I think 6 million. And then Schwarber signed with the nationals for 10. So it wasn't like it was that much. Like, listen to me talking about $4 million isn't very much, but <laughs> in that world, it's not very much. No, you know, just, you're right. And no, I just, I, I've always been a fan of Schwarber. Like before, yeah. he, like, you know, acted like he was Reggie Jackson in the playoffs. Um, even he's done better. And that's crazy, right? Think about what we think of Reggie Jackson. Home and, runs but, of a left-handed hitter in Major League Baseball history. In it's the crazy. Playoffs. But I've always been a Schwarber fan. And I just thought, like, you know, he's just a threat constantly. He, yeah. He's always been a threat. And, and, and so, like, you know, he had some injuries. He had some stuff. But for the most part, like, I just thought he was just too good to let loose and and, and, and I was saying it at the time, so I don't want to look like I'm, you know, no. that fan, that I'm that fan at the end of the day. See, I'd rather call, I'd rather talk about the Cubs than, than, than talk about anything <laughs> else. So. Uh, no, I think we could tell. And, and you know, um, we'd love to spend two hours talking half Cubs, half Purdue with you. We, <laughs> we learned so much from a basketball standpoint, but we definitely could trade Cub stories. And I'm excited for this team too, whether they get show or not. I'm, I'm drilled in on this because I think he's a perfect fit to what the nucleus they already have, but it'll be interesting to see going forward. So we appreciate your time. You know, I got off, you know, when you, when you came on, it's like shaking off the cobwebs for me. I cover the Chicago bears and coming to practice on Saturday, having you on today. I, I always want to make sure I do right by you when you carve out this time. I know Joe and Craig are always going to bring it. These guys are locked in 365 days a year. They did shows all the way through the summer. And and I also need you to know, Matt, that you scare the crap out of me. Like, I know you're the friendliest guy. You're really funny. But every <laughs> time you look at me, you scare the living daylights out of me. When we're at the <laughs> pressers, and I know I got to ask you a question next, you give this Velociraptor look. And I, I almost feel like I know you know I'm terrified of you. <laughs> <laughs> you need a support group, man. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I, we need, I can be a part of the support group. I can be there for you. These are my I don't know why. When I tell you the time, because you're you just the look, it's terrifying. You've got this. I'm life. concentrating on the question, unlike the rest of the coaches <laughs> in the country. I'm actually concentrating, and and like sometimes I get myself into a little bit of trouble because I'm just answering the question. Yes. And like as a coach, you got to protect your players. And then sometimes I'll read it and I'll be like, "Well, that's the truth," but. I didn't have to tell the whole truth. It kind of, <laughs> you know, he's 19 years old, whoever I'm talking about. Like I want to yeah. like, and so sometimes I, I get that way and I'm like, okay, like you guys got a job to do, answer your question. And so right. then I try to explain it. And so like, I don't try to lose people from a philosophical standpoint, even though I know I do sometimes I'm really trying to answer and get to the point of things. So people say like, Hey, like, why do you have struggles in the NCAA tournament? Like, okay. Let me explain to you like what we're doing, what we're trying to do, but don't sit back for a minute and think that like any game that you coach, you figure out like how they're going to go about to beat you. Like that's not a hard thing to like wrap your head around. Like, okay, they can only do so much, right? It's just basketball. It's five people. Right. And so like after you do it, so you know what's coming, but you're not the one playing. And, and, and that's a great thing that I'm not playing. And so <laughs> That that's something like that people lose sight of sometimes when they're like trying to analyze stuff or whatever is like you most of the time you know what's coming. Like, you know, now like you gotta figure it out, but you also gotta get everybody on the same page to understand that. So I'll try not to be as laser focused. Uh, no, I love it. I love it. I just wasn't sure if you realized how terrified I did not, I did it, not realize. But that. it helps me, it keeps me on my toes because then I make sure I, I'm asking the good questions because I wanna keep your and earn your respect and keep it there. Uh, but you are very informative and it really helps the fans out. Uh, Craig and Joe will be in the pressers a lot more than me this year, especially during the rest of football season. So you'll have to be easy on Joe, but Joe, Joe can handle his own. Joe knows more basketball than I, than I'll ever know in my entire life. So um, coach, we really appreciate your time. Really looking forward to the season. Uh, and we'll, we'll stay tuned with you and, um, continue to support this program and, and cover you guys as best we can. Cool. Thanks for having me on. 
Yeah, we'll talk to you soon, Matt. All right, thank you. Yep, take care. Thank you. Thanks. That Thanks. Matt Painter, head coach of the Purdue Boilermakers, scaring me every single day. Uh, hey, I was I was nervous too. Not like I was. Palms were sweating a little bit before my first question, uh, but it felt good. It felt good. Nah, he's a good dude, and he's got a really good sense of humor. But he does have this look that's just terrifying. I guess I could have shown him the look because this is what it looks like. Uh, well, I had it here earlier. I don't know where. Yeah, there it is. That's the look he gives you. So, like, he's giving you a thumbs up, like, great play. But then he's also staring through your soul. And so... <laughs> It's terrifying, but no, we love uh, Matt Painter. He's uh, to me uh, there. You can't find a better coach in this country and we're lucky to have him uh, for the program. And we're lucky to have him as fans because he does keep us informed. Uh, some of his answers after games can really open your mind up. If you just a fan like me that understands the game on a, on a very basic level and that's okay. I don't think fans, all fans need to know every aspect of the X's and O's, you know, at the end of the day, we just root for this team. You, you know, I think we've gotten to a point in some walks of life um, on social media that everybody's got to be the smartest fan. And, and I, I've never, I, I'll never resign to that idea. That's why I think there's a place for a guy like Joe and a place like Craig and a place for someone that's a fan like me and uh, becoming a smarter fan. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, it's it's just about rooting for this team however you like to root for them. So, you know, having a guy like Matt Painter that understands that and understands the different levels of media types and and fan types and and even the players he works with and how, you know, he's he's the ultimate communicator. So uh, we appreciate his extended time here on Boilers in the Stands today. Uh, so, yeah, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. And, and I apologize to the chat. I know there was a lot of people that – Threw some questions in there. I did highlight them as a possibility to ask at the back end, but we really can't be, you know, uh, carving out an hour from Matt uh, as much as we'd like to. Uh, we want to try to keep this relationship strong with him. Maybe we'd be able to convince him to come on during the season, but right now where we're comfortable at is asking him to come on before the season starts last year. He did that this year. He did that. And then we're not bugging him, you know, as much as, you know, we want the coverage and we want to be able to ask questions to him. And if there's a appropriate time during the season, maybe we can find a moment there, but this is the most comfortable spot where we know we're not completely hindering what is most important. And that's him trying to get Purdue basketball to the final four in a national championship. And as much as we cover this team, we are also fans of this team and there's different media outlets that are going to do things differently in a more traditional sense. And, you know, a lot of media doesn't like the word fan attached to media. That is not something we do here. We are fans first. And we also happen to cover this team as media second. That's how I see it when it comes to this show and what we're doing. And I appreciate, you know, the guys at Purdue, the program itself, Chris Foreman, the SID, Matt Painter, and them kind of understanding the angle we want to come at it from. And it'll always be in a passionate way, uh, but also a respectable way. Yeah, I, you worded it really well. I don't really have anything to add on top of that. How are you feeling, Craig? Ah, feeling good. Uh, I got to run here pretty quick though. Um, but I thought I'd always love having Matt Painter on, love the insight that he gives, um, whether it's a big picture question or whether we're asking about the smallest detail. Um, I, th I think that is the beauty and what he does. Um, he, he does truly listen to and try to answer the questions, even if it's from train spotters, 63 group or whatever that are asking a, a question off the wall. He's always going to try to give an answer uh, regardless of, of what the question is. So, yeah. but you know, uh, before I run here, Greg, you know, oh, just make sure just, you, you, we can all wrap together, but go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, make sure you go like boilers in the stands. We're officially over 500, something the bears aren't going to see for a long, long time. So, um, <laughs> just, <laughs> Oh, well, hey, don't jinx it because you, know, you talked all that crap about the Cubs in the summer when we went to our when we went on our boilers in the stands retreat with Bobby Riddell to the Wrigley Field bleachers. We were at our lowest point at that point for the Cubs and then they took off. So please give that same kind of reverse jinx <laughs> for the Bears. I need it desperately. They did win on Sunday. So we're going for a winning streak, my friend. I mean, we haven't had one in three years. So 
I will uh, say, uh, just jumping off the the clips that or the how well Painter does with these questions, I'm definitely going to be going back and listening to that question about like what the hedge defense does and all like the little things. I I think that was a a super super insightful answer. It's just like it's just not stuff you get normally from just uh, generalized interviews and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's cool that he's even willing to kind of disclose that type of information as well. Yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up. Craig's got a jet. He's got more work to do, as does Joe and I. So um, we're going to keep this one tight with uh, Painter coming on here today and giving us some extended time. So, uh, again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, our brand new Twitter account, at Boilers in Stands. Uh, once we reach 1,000 followers, we're going to be giving away a signed Zach Eady jersey. Uh, we're going to continue to put content on there, on our Facebook page, uh, on the Brags in the Stands network as it's uh, kind of transitioning to. So we can cover, you know, I can continue to cover the Chicago sports teams, but we're also going to have our Boilers uh, section for all of you diehard Boiler fans. So make sure you're following Craig, uh, you know, at Craig Bowers 34. Go to their Boiler Diehards Facebook group. It's a private group. If you haven't joined it already, you absolutely should. Uh, it's boy for boilers, uh, fans only of all boilers, uh, boilermaker sports. So Joe Jackson at feed the post as well. Yeah. Here comes the Midwest. Goodbye. Just trying to give all my soliloquies. We can do that another day Saturday. I don't know if we plan on doing it. We can talk about this after the show, but Saturday Purdue does play Arkansas. So be on the lookout for a potential post game show following that game. Not everybody will be able to watch it. It is on ESPN plus. So, uh, depending on who, right. Am I yeah. correct? It's on S sec network plus, but it'll also SC be oh, that's ESPN right. plus. Okay. You can get ES it through ESPN plus ESPN plus or sec network plus. So, you know, depending on who's able to watch it, um, we're, we, we probably will do a post game show for that as long as our schedules allow it. So we appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, you know, we had a mailbag show, Brad, if you want to check that out. We're just going to start rolling out shows now. So just stay tuned, no. turn your notifications on. Go ahead, Craig. I think he's talking about the Purdue schedule uh, preview show that we were talking about the other oh, day. Okay. We do have, we do have that confirmed for next Thursday. Eric Haslam's going to come on. Uh, I think it'll be just Joe and I, I don't think. There's a chance I'll be on. Okay. We'll see if yeah. the Holly, uh, you'll see, we'll see if Hollywood can join. <laughs> uh so all right so that yeah thursday eric haslam from haslam metrics coming on next thursday next, next thursday. not this thursday next thursday i'll let craig handle the announcements since i don't know <laughs> what the hell's happening here on my on our show uh you'd think i would but i don't I just let, leave it to these guys don't ask me questions anymore i'm just here for the ride uh so all right again that wraps things up you guys take care enjoy the rest of your uh monday afternoon We'll catch you here soon. Thank you to head coach Matt Painter. And thank you to everybody that's tuned in. Please hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, we'll see you here soon. So always boiler up.